Item number, SCP-009. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. Object is to be contained within a sealed storage tank of heat-resistant alloy, with dimensions not less than 2 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters. Under no circumstances should SCP-009 be exposed to temperatures in excess of 0 degrees Celsius when not undergoing testing, and no water-based solutions shall be allowed within 30 meters of the object's containment area. Object's chamber is to be fitted with temperature sensors, which must be monitored at all times, and is to be kept refrigerated by no fewer than three redundant cooling units. Any malfunction of sensors or of coolant systems is to be reported and repaired immediately. If at any time the temperature in the containment area climbs above negative 5 degrees Celsius, the chamber is to be locked down and flooded with coolant until temperatures return to safe levels, negative 30 degrees Celsius to negative 25 degrees Celsius. Containment area is to be kept in total vacuum during testing, and personnel interacting with SCP-009 must wear full environmental protection gear. Following testing, all equipment, personnel, and other materials must undergo dehydration procedures and be quarantined for no less than 12 hours. Any moisture found displaying properties of SCP-009 is to be quarantined and added to the containment area as soon as possible. Living organisms found to be contaminated by SCP-009 are to be terminated by chemical desiccation and extracted molecules of SCP-009 added to containment. Description SCP-009 is approximately liters of a substance which superficially resembles distilled water, H2O, except with a distinct bright red hue. This red hue is discernible in all phases and serves as the most expedient method of identifying contaminated matter before its anomalous properties manifest. In contrast to mundane water, SCP-009 assumes a liquid phase at temperatures between negative 100 degrees Celsius and 0 degrees Celsius, and a solid state above those temperatures. At temperatures below negative 100 degrees Celsius, SCP-009 vaporizes into a gaseous phase similar to steam. Examinations of the atomic structure of SCP-009 have proved inconclusive. The substance appears to be identical to normal water molecules, with the exception of in contrast to standard laws of enthalpy. Dr. Cite a resident expert on xenospatial physics, suggests that SCP-009 may originate in a universe with alternate physical laws. The most hazardous property of SCP-009, however, is its ability to contaminate normal H2O. When in contact with any aqueous solution, SCP-009 will, through unknown mechanisms, transfer its anomalous properties to other objects and creatures. Testing has shown it capable of assimilating ice, steam, tea, fruit juice, seawater, blood, and data expunged. The time it takes for this process to occur varies depending on temperature and the exact chemical composition of affected matter, and had been observed as taking between 3 minutes and hours. Experiments on D-Class personnel have illustrated the process of conversion by the substance, which has been found to follow a consistent pattern. 1. Initial Exposure Subject is exposed to SCP-009, and it begins assimilating any moisture present on the exposed surface. Creatures in this stage do not commonly notice any unusual symptoms except for a slight warming sensation. 2. Surface Conversion Frost begins to form on the exposed area as the heat produced by the subject and SCP-009 itself raises its temperature above 0 degrees Celsius. This stage can take anywhere from 1 minute to hours, during which time subjects begin to feel crystals from the epidermis. 3. Deep Tissue Conversion Exponential increase in temperature of SCP-009 causes runaway reaction throughout subject's body resulting in actual blood loss is minimal due to ice crystals allowing subjects to remain alive and conscious for up to hours. 4. Data Expunged Testing on D-Class personnel was discontinued as of 4-23-2000 Addendum Circumstances of Retrieval Subject was found in Alaska on November 5th, 19 the Foundation became involved after reports were obtained from the native tribe 
who came across the mangled bodies of a team of seal hunters, which had apparently been shipwrecked kilometers from the village. All victims were found encased in red ice. Cause of death recorded is internal bleeding, though closer examination found it is surmised that the low ambient temperatures in the area retarded the freezing process. This prolonged the time to total conversion by hours and allowed the victims to remain conscious until data expunged. Origin of SCP-009 is currently unknown. Investigation into similar events or materials in the area is ongoing. Evidence at the scene suggests possibly involving SCP- See Exploration Log A009-1 for details. Exploration Log November 5th, 19... Situation Report Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Has Matters, was deployed to recovery site to catalog and safely retrieve samples of SCP-009 for transport to site... Agent... Bryce, MTFB-7, made a visual inspection of the area and noted three bodies, all male, between the ages of and 40 years. Dr. also on site, surmised from the relative position of subjects that Mr. age 32, hereafter referred to as Subject Zero, was the origin point of Subsequent subjects are presumed to have been exposed to SCP-009 while attempting to help Subject Zero back to the wreckage of the boat. During standard perimeter sweep, Agent Hughes located what appeared to be humanoid tracks leading northeast. After brief deliberation, a three-man team consisting of Agents Hughes, Whitmore, and Cassidy was dispatched to investigate potential security breach. Begin Log 642-43 EST Agent Hughes, we found something, Control. It's a cave. The tracks lead inside. Control. Copy, Hughes. What do you see? Hughes. Looks like a crack in the ice. It's maybe a meter tall. The opening's not very wide. Agent Whitmore. Captain, we got a body. Unidentified shuffling noises are heard. Control. We didn't copy, Hughes. Repeat. Hughes. There's a subject here, Control. Frozen in the skip. Male. About 15. Looks like he was trying to crawl away from something. There's a spear gun here. Also frozen. It's been fired. Control. Any signs of trauma? Agent Cassidy. Without touching him, I can't be sure. But it looks like he was stabbed by something. See how he's gripping his chest here? Right where this spike is growing out. He might have been attacked. Hughes. Did you hear her, Control? Control. Affirmative. Tag the coordinates for recovery and proceed into the cave. Whitmore. We using live fire, Captain? Hughes, there might be hostiles, so yes, but keep them in single shot mode, don't want the guns getting too hot. Cassidy, good call, don't want to end up like this guy. Whitmore, unintelligible, that's for sure. Agents ready their weapons and proceed, approximately two minutes pass. Whitmore, unintelligible. Control, please repeat Hughes, we didn't copy. Hughes, it's, there's a chamber in here, Control. I'd say five or six meters in diameter. It's filled with red ice. In the middle, there's a pool. Looks about three meters wide. Depth unknown. Cassidy, the f cat. Screams are heard. Gunfire. Control. Hughes, come in. Are there hostiles? There is a brief pause. Hughes. F hell. Negative control, just. Jesus, a f polar bear. It's dead. There's dozens of bodies here. Not human. I see a few seals, a snow fox, and a... What the hell? Whitmore. The f*** is that? Cassidy. No, 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 no. Oh, God. Control. Hughes, do you copy? Hughes. Cassidy found a... Um... A spider. A giant spider. There is a pause, during which shuffling and hard breathing are heard. Control. Is it alive? What do you mean by giant? Hughes. I mean f***ing huge control. At least a meter leg span. It's frozen. Wait, no. Sh I don't see anything inside. It almost looks like it's made of this stuff. Cassidy. Unintelligible. Not possible. 
We're nowhere close to Germany. Whitmore. What? What about Germany? Cassidy. Captain. I'm pretty sure that's 3023. Control. Repeat, Captain. Hughes. Cassidy said the spider is SCP-3023, Control. There is a pause. Control. That's not possible, Hughes. Why would she think that? Cassidy, voice elevated. I'm sure, Control. I've worked with 3023. It's an instant made of Skip 9. Whitmore. Wait, what's 3023? Control. That is classified. Agent Cassidy, you are to speak no more of this. If the specimen is destroyed, there is no reason to worry about it. Please continue your search. Cassidy, mumbling. But how the f did it get here? Hughes. We copy control. Cassidy, sweep the perimeter. See if there's any side tunnels. Cassidy, but Hughes. That's an order. Cassidy, unintelligible. Hughes. Check these corpses. See if there's any humans. Whitmore, on it. Control. Agent Hughes, how deep is the pool you mentioned? Hughes, can't see the bottom. God, I'm having SCP-354 flashbacks. This is not cool. Control. Focus, Captain. Is there anything nearby you can use to measure the depth? Hughes pauses. Well, the spider has a spear sticking out of it. Control. Can you safely retrieve it? Hughes. The suit should protect me, right? Control. All the same, try not to touch the affected material. Hughes. All right. I've got it. Should work. Looks to be about 1.5 meters long. Control. Copy that, Hughes. Proceed with caution. There is a pause. Hughes. Well, it's definitely more than a meter deep. I could go further, but I'd have to get my hand closer to that stuff. Suit or no suit, I'd prefer not to do that. Control. Affirmative, Captain. We'll dispatch some D-Class with gear to test that out. Continue your search. Hughes. Copy that. Well, I guess I'm... Cassidy. Voice distant. Captain. Hughes. Stand by, Control. What is it, Cassidy? Cassidy. Voice distant. I think you're going to want to see this, sir. I think I know where the spider came from. Hughes. Control, I'm going deeper in the cave. Control. Affirmative. Proceed. Approximately one minute of boots crunching on ice and packed snow. Hughes. Oh, that's not good. Control. What do you see, Captain? Hughes. Uh, an aperture. About a meter in diameter. It's covered in the stuff. Cassidy! Ten seconds of silence. Hughes. Report! Control. Do you have a visual of Agent Cassidy? Hughes. No. Sh she must have gone inside. Control. Please remain calm. Describe this aperture. Hughes. I, uh... It just looks like a tunnel, but there's no ice past the mouth. Red or otherwise. I can make out a dim light coming from somewhere inside. Might be Cassidy's torch. Control. Is there anything else unusual? Hughes. Cassidy. Cassidy. Control. Captain Hughes, please respond. Is there anything else unusual about the tunnel? Hughes. Yeah, it's... It's wet. The walls are. And the floor. There's a puddle about a meter down. Sh it's... The puddle is red. A few minutes of breathing and shuffling noises. Hughes. Control, did you get that? Control. Affirmative. Stand by. 30 seconds of breathing, followed by approaching footsteps. Whitmore. Yo, what's up? Where's Cassidy? Hughes. She went in there. Whitmore. Yo, Cassidy. Holla back, girl. 30 seconds of silence. Hughes. Unintelligible. Control, I'm going in there. Control. Negative, Hughes. We're rerouting a team of D-Class for recovery. Your orders are to withdraw the rest of your team and await further orders. Hughes. Whitmore. Whoa, hold up. Take it easy. Control. You have your orders, Hughes. I don't think I need to remind you. Data expunged. 45 seconds of silence. Hughes. Copy control. Let's go. End log. Addendum. November 9th, 19... After initial report and retrieval of specimens, 
It was confirmed that the arachnoid entity found by MTFB-7 was indeed a previously unknown instance of SCP-3023. Investigation has revealed the instance originated in as a result of data expunged. Addendum, December 6, 19... After repeated inquiries, it should be noted that the portion of coastline upon which the initial victims were found was barren rock, approximately meters from the seashore, and was sufficiently dry and cold to prevent significant contamination of the surrounding area. Had the site been closer to the water, there is little doubt an extinction-level event would have ensued. Consideration of upgrading SCP-009 to Keter class under review. Addendum, December 16th, 2000. Supercooling of SCP-009 for the purposes of experimentation is disallowed until further notice. Personnel are advised that liquid nitrogen is only to be used on the subject in controlled amounts, and only until temperatures have reached acceptable levels. Related note. Possible application of SCP-009 in cold fusion research pending evaluation. Memo from O5 Command, January 9th, 2000. We've decided to keep this thing Euclid for now. We understand the concerns raised, but as long as you keep the power on and nobody goes near its containment area, there shouldn't be a problem. That's why we're keeping it in sight after all. As for the cold fusion research, we're putting a pin in that for now. Frankly, we don't have it in the budget for another snafu like Site. The salvage team still hasn't found Dr. Cross-testing report 9507F23. The following experiment record was recovered via a chance occurrence of SCP-507 shifting into a universe in which the described test was carried out using SCP-107. The applicability of the reported findings to our own universe is pending review. Input, 10 milliliters of SCP-009. Result, red snow fell in test area for 27 minutes with moderate intensity. Grass growing in test area began runaway reaction, which ended with entire area being frozen within minutes. Notably, anti-enthalpathic reaction of SCP-009 did not extend past the effective radius of SCP-107 for reasons still under investigation. Non-grass plants in area turned bright red in color, greatly expanded, and mutated to display cyan-colored tentacles similar to those of species Drosera capensis. Mucilage produced by these tentacles later found to be tiny beads of SCP-009. How the plant is able to survive with SCP-009 integrated into its cell structure is currently under investigation with preliminary hypothesis being the plant is a reflection of flora from the substance's native universe. Item number, SCP-16. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. SCP-16 is to remain within the confines of a 5x5x5 five by five by five meter room at all times, maintained at a temperature not to exceed zero degrees Celsius. SCP-16 itself is to remain in the petri dish in the containment cube at all times, unless directed otherwise by Level 4 or O5 personnel. Full documentation of experimentation with SCP-16 must be submitted before and after samples and duplicates of SCP-16 may be taken. Failure to follow these procedures will result in termination or reassignment as Class D personnel. Only authorized personnel may be permitted to obtain samples of and experiment with SCP-16 under BCL-5 containment conditions. If an outbreak does occur despite following the aforementioned procedures, directive-based personnel are to implement a Code Sigma lockdown and containment plan. Infected personnel are to be terminated on site by security forces wearing standard mission-oriented protective posture, or MOPP, anti-biological and anti-chemical equipment. Should the infection not be contained after 48 hours, the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated. Remaining personnel are not to be evacuated under any circumstances. SCP-16 has been shown to survive for up to 6 hours on hard surfaces, and up to several minutes in air. High-intensity ultraviolet light and high concentrations of orthothalaldehyde solution have been demonstrated to be effective in disinfecting non-organic surfaces. Description SCP-16 is a blood-borne pathogen recovered from a mine worker and 
who injured himself while working in a deep coal seam. Said wound became contaminated with coal dust from the mine, possibly infecting the worker with dormant spores. Over the next several days, SCP-16 proceeded to infect the remaining employees at the mining camp, as well as the CDC crisis team dispatched to deal with the epidemic. Foundation personnel then took over the investigation and terminated all affected personnel. Patient Zero was brought into captivity, and the mine shaft was collapsed by an explosive device. SCP-16 has an incubation period ranging from 24 hours to 2 years, depending on the presence and number of other human hosts in the area. First symptoms resemble the common cold and include itchy eyes, runny nose, coughing, and bodily aches. Phase 2 begins in 48 hours and consists of a controlled form of hemorrhagic fever as the organism causes a small amount of blood to become aspirated in the lungs, creating an aerosol effect. During Phase 3, the host crashes and bleeds out, bleeding profusely from every bodily orifice, including the nose, tear ducts, anus, skin pores, mouth, urethra, and in case of females, vagina. Blood pressure skyrockets during the final stage. Hosts have been observed projectile vomiting blood to distances of over 5 meters. Should the host survive this near-total exsanguination, the pathogen will become dormant once more, returning to incubation phase. What distinguishes SCP-16 from other strains of hemorrhagic fever such as Ebola and Marburg is its unusual response to high stress. Should the subject undergo a high stress situation, such as a life-threatening crisis, the organism will change its survival tactic from rapid reproduction to the rewriting of the host's DNA and stimulation of rapid cell division. Major physiological changes occur within the first 24 hours, with complete bodily reconstruction occurring within two weeks' time. Most hosts do not survive the process due to the heavy demands made on the body. Due to their similarities as fatal contagions that stimulate the production of excess organs, a possible link to SCP-1801 is under investigation. An interesting side effect of the transformation is an increased aggressive urge. It is believed that this may be an attempt to maximize the spread of the virus in a manner similar to rabies. On another note, subjects who undergo bodily transformation no longer appear to exhibit SCP-16's hemorrhagic properties. However, Subjects infected by transformed hosts will still undergo the normal SCP-16 infection process. Addendum Experiment Log of SCP-16's Transformative Properties Subject D-16-1 D-Class Personnel Infected by SCP-16 Upon first showing symptoms, subjects' quarters were slowly flooded with water over a 24-hour period. SCP-16 mutated into a teratomorphic state transforming subjects' lungs into gills. Subjects survived for two more weeks as SCP-16 transformed its limbs into fins, caused its eyes to atrophy, and enhanced its sense of hearing into a cetacean-type echolocation ability. Subject was terminated by draining all water from its quarters, causing it to asphyxiate. Body was subsequently cremated without autopsy. Subject D-16-2 D-Class Personnel Infected by SCP-16 Upon first showing symptoms, subjects' quarters were slowly flooded with water over a 24-hour period. SCP-16 mutated into a teratomorphic state, causing subject to undergo rapid muscular growth and increased bone growth on knuckles. Subject then attempted to escape from confinement by punching through the reinforced steel door. Subject was not successful and died by drowning. Note, same situation, two different responses. Interesting. Dr. B Subject D-16-3 D-Class Personnel Infected by SCP-16 Subject was previously a chemical engineer who poisoned his wife upon discovering her adultery. Upon first showing symptoms, subject's quarters were slowly flooded with water over a 24-hour period. SCP-16 mutated into a teratomorphic state, causing subject to grow an unusual organ on his chest, consisting of a chamber and two separate tubes. Organ continued to take in water and swell in size until Foundation personnel, realizing what SCP-16 may be attempting, terminated the subject by gunshot. Organ was found to contain several gas sacs filled with acetylene gas and oxygen. Subject D-16-4 D 
D-Class personnel infected by SCP-16. Subject was told to concentrate on forming wings. No stress was applied. SCP-16 did not mutate into teratomorphic state. Subject died of exsanguination during Phase 3. Subject D-16-5, D-Class personnel infected by SCP-16. Subject was told to concentrate on forming wings and placed in an acrylic box suspended 305 meters or 1,000 feet above a mine shaft. A timer was placed outside the box which subject was told indicated the time to release. SCP-16 mutated into teratomorphic state, causing subject to grow a tentacle-like organ on his left wrist similar to a spider's spinnerets. Subject extended said organ through one of the box's air holes and extruded a strong, silk-like substance, which it then used to secure the box to the cable. Subject was terminated when the countdown reached zero, and the bomb detonated. Item Number SCP-20 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Samples of SCP-20 are stored in a series of sealed cultivation chambers inside a sealed containment room at Biological Research Area 12, which is accessible only via airlock. Nutrients are administered via automated robotic systems, as the cultivation chamber must remain sealed at all times. Hermetically sealed video surveillance cameras are installed within the containment room and must be checked daily for integrity. Any personnel entering the containment room must wear biosafety level 5 equipment, including rebreathers and undergo full antifungal disinfection upon exiting. Description: SCP-20 is a fast-spreading fungal organism that is capable of affecting the senses and behavior of living creatures, including humans. Samples of SCP-20 exhibit an unknown effect that renders them effectively invisible to direct observation, even when under a microscope. SCP-20 is only visible to humans when viewed through photographic or video surveillance. Once SCP-20 forms a colony, usually within a human residence, it will produce spores that affect the behavior of humans around it. Affected subjects will increase the heat and humidity within their homes to create an environment more suitable to the growth of SCP-20. Affected subjects also become more sociable in many cases and often invite acquaintances to their homes to further spread the organism. As the spores and mold colonies are invisible to affected subjects, the mold may sometimes grow directly on living subjects. As the spores and colonies within a home approach critical concentration, the health of affected human subjects will rapidly deteriorate, resulting in death. Further spread of the mold may occur as the bodies of any deceased subjects are encountered by emergency responders and healthcare agents, as well as transportation of the bodies to local morgues. SCP-20 was first encountered in where an undercover SCP agent noted dramatic personality changes in personnel working at the local hospital. Upon investigation by a containment team, it was discovered that almost civilians had been infected, as well as a majority of the town. The civilian population was terminated, and the town incinerated under cover of a local flash forest fire. To date, over 12 outbreaks of SCP-20 have been reported. Investigations are currently underway to determine the source of these outbreaks and possible preventative measures. Addendum 20-01 Excerpts from the audio-video mission recorders of Mobile Task Force Ada-10 See No Evil During the initial containment of SCP-20 on T2 Lead Team 2 moving to the Red House T2 Com Copy UAV-1 is picking up one heat signature. T2 lead. Team 2 in place, ready to br- T2-2, door opening. At this point, a civilian woman appeared in the doorway, holding a kitchen knife. Video surveillance showed that nearly two-thirds of her face was covered by mold growths. Civilian woman. Well, hello there, gentlemen. Care to take a breather inside? T2 lead. On the ground, drop the weapon. Civilian woman, don't be silly, come on in and stay a while. T2 lead, stop where you are, drop the weapon. Civilian woman, we, we just want to have some guests, please come in. T2 2, drop that weapon. 
It is assumed that at this point, the infected civilian noticed T2-4 carrying a primed incendiary weapon and lunged forward at the team members with the knife. Civilian woman, data expunged. T2 lead. Open fire, open fire! Gunfire. Screaming. Item number, SCP-047. Object class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures SCP-047 is to be contained in a 0.5 meter by 0.5 meter by 1 meter hermetically sealed storage box at all times. This box is to be locked in Storage Locker 047A inside P3 Secure Biohazard Lab 047B. Any entrance to and activity inside 047B will be recorded by biometric scan, closed circuit camera, and Entry to 047B requires the authorization of the project manager, in addition to at least one O5 level clearance. SCP-047 is to be treated as a priority four contagious biohazard in all protocols, including mandatory quarantine if exposed. Suite Q-047 has been provided, adjunct to Lab 047B for this purpose. In the event of outside contamination of SCP-047-1, Lockdown Protocol 047-01, Yersinia, must be engaged. Description: SCP-047 is a heavily rusted breached gas cylinder made of an iron alloy. When exposed to open air, the material of the cylinder evaporates slowly, producing a previously undocumented mutagenic gas. This gas has no effect on eukaryotic organisms, for example humans but profoundly alters prokaryotes, showing preference for common human microbiota, the natural microorganisms that live on the skin and throughout the body. On rare occasions, these mutations produce a superbug, collectively known as SCP-047-1, a natural commensal with enhanced survivability and therefore opportunistic pathogenicity. The pattern of changes induced by SCP-047 suggests that these highly infectious microbes are, at least to some degree, selected for. Although the specifics of SCP-047-1 species are dependent on the base bacterium from which it is derived, there are several characteristics which appear to be generally consistent across all cases of SCP-047-1 mutation. Enhanced survivability in the bacterium's natural environment and similar environments. Full spectrum antibiotic resistance. Increased reproduction rate and consumption of available material. Development of a spore relation ability in gram-positive bacteria. Increased ability to uptake, hold, and share plasmids, particularly in gram-negative bacteria. Increased transmission due to traits described above. SCP-047-1 samples are normally debilitating and virulent. However, compared to other Keter class SCPs, it should be noted that SCP-047-1 have a relatively low mortality rate due to their action through mundane biological pathways. Several strains of bacteria have been selectively mutated by SCP-047. Mutation of bacteria in culture is possible, but the process appears to be much more effective with bacteria living on a human host. Generally, mutation of natural commensals for experimental purposes is encouraged. After the containment breach of January 30th, 2010, mutation of already pathogenic species is banned, and all existing samples must be destroyed. Three particular species of SCP-047-1 mutated bacteria are of note, due to their involvement in the containment breach. Propiana bacterium 047-A is a strain of Propionum bacteria acnes, mutated by SCP-047. Pathogenicity Severe skin colonization around sebaceous glands. Modification of skin pH to levels that become toxic to skin cells. Massive inflammation and immune cell infiltration. Eventual breakdown of skin structure, leading to sepsis. Transmission. Transmitted by skin-to-skin -skin contact. Can remain active on inorganic surfaces for up to five hours. Lethality. Approximately 40% mortality rate. Runs its course in two to six weeks. Very visible symptoms within 5 to 10 hours. Contagious within 2 to 5 hours. Handling. As soon as visible symptoms form, victims must be quarantined. 
deceased victims should be incinerated. Streptococcus 047-C is a strain of Streptococcus mitis mutated by SCP-047. Pathogenicity causes inflammation of the mouth and esophagus initially, leads to open sores in the mouth, which result in S-047-C entering the bloodstream and becoming septic. Death is usually due to infectious endocarditis. Transmission Droplet can remain active indefinitely by sporulation. Lethality Approximately 35% mortality rate may become a recurring chronic condition if non-lethal. Handling Subjects with any sign of mouth infection should be quarantined. Deceased victims should be incinerated. Clostridium 047-A is a strain of Clostridium difficile mutated by SCP-047. Pathogenicity Unknown C-047-A was developed from tissue culture and has never been exposed to a human. No samples remain in Foundation control. Transmission Unknown Presumably transmitted through fecal contamination, as with C. difficile. Due to smaller, more robust spores, may aerosolize with flatus. Effects of aerosol intake of Z-047-A cannot be predicted. Lethality Unknown Presumed extremely high risk of destruction of endothelial lining of gastrointestinal tract, leading to inflammation, sepsis, and toxic megacolon. Handling until further research has been done, victims should be quarantined and placed under 24-hour medical observation to develop functional diagnostics for this strain. Deceased victims should not be incinerated until adequate etiological research has been performed. Incident Report Yersinia 047-01, 2010 SCP Involved SCP-047 Description on January 30th, 2010, at approximately 0300 hours, Storage Locker 047C, containing bacterial samples mutated by SCP-047, was compromised after a complete simultaneous data expunged, leading to failure of security measures in the area. Three samples of a total 12 were stolen. Since the initial containment break, outbreaks of one of the stolen bacterial strains, Propiana Bacterium 047-A, were recorded globally in communities of increasing size and population density. Further information on stolen material, spread, and containment follows. Compromised Items Propiana Bacterium 047-A, Streptococcus 047-C, and Clostridium 047-A. Outbreak Information First Outbreak February 27, 2010, Siberia Contained Second Outbreak P-047-A March 30th, 2010 Northwest Territories, Canada Contained Third Outbreak April 29th, 2010 South Australia Contained Fourth Outbreak May 27th, 2010 Mato Grosso, Brazil Believed Contained Warning Agents in the area are advised to familiarize themselves with the symptoms of P-047-A and be on the lookout for possible infection. Fifth Outbreak June 26, 2010 Iraq Site immediately data expunged, which is believed to have contained the infection. Access to incident report denied without O5 clearance. Sixth Outbreak July 26, 2010 Cameroon Quarantine enacted Efforts to track outgoing civilians underway. Infection not contained. Seventh Outbreak August 24th, 2010 Dalarna, Sweden. Quarantine enacted. Believed contained. Warning. Agents in the area are advised to familiarize themselves with the symptoms of P-047-A and be on the lookout for possible infection. Eighth Outbreak Not recorded. Believed to have taken place in North Korea. Data expunged. Agents with government access are attempting to gain access to parallel information, but due to data expunged, local services have been extremely uncooperative. Containment status unknown. Ninth outbreak. October 23rd, 2010. South Carolina, United States of America. Quarantine enacted. 
Efforts to track outgoing civilians primarily successful. One civilian in a pickup truck is believed to have data expunged. Infection not contained. Resolution. Reports from data expunged indicate no further outbreaks are believed likely, but agents are advised to be on the lookout for new flare-ups resulting from uncontained civilians in previous outbreak regions. These may continue for years to come due to P047-A sporulation. Investigation into the cause of the initial compromise is underway. Anyone with useful information may anonymously contact security via the attached form. Recovery Log 047 SCP-047 was recovered from Site Secure Laboratory by a Foundation Biohazard Recovery Team in response to a full compromise situation in 1990. Testing logs indicate that the research team was attempting to contain data expunged in an SCP-stable pressure cylinder, which led to combining with the initial release of gas when SCP-047 was structurally compromised was sufficient to cause a microbiotal bloom of uncounted species of SCP-047-1, killing all staff in the lab within hours. Exposed staff obeyed standard Foundation quarantine and containment protocol, and the infection was contained successfully. Item Number SCP-021 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-021 is an obligate parasite of the human body. Containment, therefore, is no more difficult than containing an adult human. Most cells will suffice. Item is currently housed in Detention Cell 217A on Subject D-139. Only Class D personnel are eligible for hosting SCP-021. As long as a given subject survives as a host for SCP-021, he is exempt from normal monthly terminations of Class D personnel. Description SCP-021 takes the form of a large and elaborate tattoo of a serpentine dragon in the Oriental style, covering approximately 0.8 meters squared of skin. This tattoo is fully animate within the confines of its host's skin and behaves largely as a normal animal would, albeit in only two dimensions. The tattoo's movement causes constant pain to its host, comparable and similar in character to simultaneous tattooing and tattoo removal on a large scale. The organism tends to spend most of its time on and near the torso. SCP-021 displays no intelligence beyond a basic pattern of feeding and locomotion, although actually measuring the intelligence of a two-dimensional life form has proven impossible thus far. SCP-021 appears to feed exclusively on pigments in the host's skin. This can include melanin, in which case the subject appears to be suffering from vitiligo. However, the organism shows a marked preference for other tattoos, and will seek out and devour these before resorting to natural pigments. It should be noted that the feeding process itself, beyond the sensation of movement, is painless. Normal tattoo ink simply vanishes as it is eaten. The organism maintains a constant size, and no excretions have been observed. The organism is capable of clearing over 0.6 meters squared of skin per hour. One may feed SCP-021 by quickly tattooing fruits or small animals on the host. SCP-021 can be transferred between hosts by various forms of physical contact, with differing rates of success. In the case of successful transfer, the organism simply swims from one person to the other. Sexual intercourse appears to be the most reliable method of transfer, with a 93% rate of transmission. However, due to the severe pain involved, this is less than ideal. Contact between two open wounds is generally preferable. Transfer is more complicated in deceased subjects, though not unreasonably so. The organism suffers no ill effects from the death of its host, and continues to consume pigments. Transmission between species is unknown. Previous tests suggest it to be either impossible or exceedingly rare. SCP-021 does confer some benefits to its host. The tattoo has been proven to accelerate the release and reuptake of epinephrine and decrease lactic acid buildup, providing boosts of strength, confidence, and pain tolerance in stressful situations, and reducing the usual after-effects of weakness and fatigue. In addition, the tattoo seems to have some beneficial effect on the host's immune system. Aggression profiles in hosts are generally higher than average, 
though whether this is a direct effect of the tattoo or simply a reaction to the constant pain remains to be seen. The symbiotic relationship is usually limited by how long the host can tolerate such pain in everyday life. This has culminated in suicide in a number of subjects. In rare cases, hosts have also fallen victim to fatal skin infections. SCP-021's origins and nature are a mystery. Tracing its transmission from host to host is hardly feasible within the confines of secrecy, and the organism could well be hundreds of years old, if not more. Nevertheless, SCP-021's captivity is one of the longest in the Foundation's history, at nearly data expunged years, and has been very educational thus far. Current research focuses mainly on observing the characteristics of life in two dimensions. Item Number SCP-125 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Supports for instances of SCP-125 are kept in padded boxes and covered with a fine nylon mesh that allows vision through but obscures the surface of the mirror by at least 25%. These supports consist of a polished metallic surface, currently silver-plated brass, with no sharp or irregular edges, which must imperatively be smoothed out to prevent rips in the protective mesh. To further prevent incidents, any person penetrating the room where SCP-125 is located must also wear such a protective mesh over their face. Metal-plated glass mirrors should be avoided for the purpose of containment as SCP-125 is capable of moving from the glass itself to the metal surface. Any metallic surface in the room must be dulled to prevent reflections. As an additional security measure, the room is kept in darkness and monitored only via infrared and ultraviolet lighting when no experiment is taking place. No mirror or comparably reflective surface, including but not limited to metal case pens, sunglasses, laptop computers, and glass objects may be allowed in the room outside controlled experiments. The SCP may not be photographed or filmed in its unrestrained state. If any personnel on site, and particularly personnel having recently been involved with SCP-125, report seeing black dots, MTF-8-10 and Chai-7 will be immediately put on standby, and a level 2 alert for potential containment breach will be declared. Individuals contaminated will undergo Containment Protocol 125B and may not return to active duty until the instance of SCP-125 affecting their cornea has been rendered completely inert. Description: SCP-125 is an apparently sentient being that can only exist within reflections. At rest and viewed up front, it takes the form of a black circle, 17.2 millimeters in diameter resting on the reflective surface. Its first anomalous characteristic is that it appears as a perfect circle to any observer, regardless of the surface's angles, bends, and the location of the viewer or viewers. In that regard, it acts more as if it were a sphere in contact with the surface, but lacking any shadow or highlight. And this, even where an obstacle such as containment mesh, makes it clear SCP-125 does not extend beyond the surface it has imprinted to. SCP-125 does not reflect visible light or infrared. When observed in ultraviolet, however, data expunged, up to and including data expunged. For unclear reasons, it also emits a minute but measurable and constant amount of X-rays. SCP-125 is capable of movement across the surface it currently exists on. This movement may only occur across a surface uninterrupted by either an angle, the surface must follow a reasonably continuous curve, or a non-reflective area. SCP-125 has demonstrated incapability to cross scratches in frosted or etched areas of a surface. In many instances, however, SCP-125 will circumvent these limits by jumping to a reflection to round a corner, or between the separate outer glass and silver surfaces of a metal glass mirror, hence the preference for opaque metallic surfaces for containment purposes. Although capable of moving anywhere along the surface, SCP-125 generally remains immobile, in a location near its edges if any, and if on a surface that has a specific immobile orientation, will usually remain in the lower right corner or its equivalent, even if the item is later moved. Any reflective surface capable of displaying a reasonably accurate reflection of SCP-125 can host it, 
So far, this has included a wide range of mirror quality surfaces. Glasses, polished or varnished surfaces such as stone and wood, glossy plastic, and even undisturbed pools of liquid or polished nails. When reflected by another surface, SCP-125 is capable of instantly transferring to it. However, SCP-125 cannot survive on or transfer to or away from a surface smaller than its own area, approximately 2.32 square centimeters. Should it be constrained to one, it will rapidly become translucent and disappear completely. The entity has demonstrated a certain level of sentience and even sapience. Despite lacking physical existence, it appears unwilling to be touched directly or otherwise hidden from sight. It will also resist, to the best of its abilities, any attempt at reducing its freedom of movement, either by jumping to another surface or moving across its current one very fast. It will also flee from perceived threats, even complex ones expressed by speech, demonstrating an understanding of human communication. How it is capable of this, and whether it can or wishes to communicate back, is currently unknown. In its normal state, SCP-125 is completely harmless and incapable of multiplying. It is, however, perfectly capable of moving to a living reflective surface, specifically that of a living animal's cornea. It will, in fact, do everything in its power to do so, indicative of a natural desire. Once it has achieved this, SCP-125 diminishes in size by a factor of 10 to 1.72 millimeters in diameter. While existing on the surface of a living tissue, SCP-125 becomes capable of multiplying and infecting a potentially unlimited number of surfaces, as opposed to merely moving between them. This multiplication occurs within the cornea, rapidly causing the victim to complain of seeing dots. Past this stage, the SCP-125 infestation will rapidly, within five to nine days of initial infection, crowd out the entire tissue causing the eye to go blind, after which stage the cells of the eye and optic nerve appear to undergo mass apoptosis, causing a non-infectious abscess. Why this occurs has yet to be elucidated. Only after the apoptotic stage has run its course does SCP-125 cease being contagious. No treatment for SCP-125 infestation is known to be efficient beyond keeping the affected eyes tightly covered to prevent further spread and administration of heavy antibiotics to reduce risk of infection. Outbreaks continue to occur on an irregular basis, suggesting that SCP-125 is either a naturally occurring phenomenon or that it was spread over much of the planet at some point prior to the beginning of written history. Item Number SCP-129 Object Class Keter. Special Containment Procedures SCP-129 is at large in the world and infects large numbers of humans and animals daily. As such, containment efforts are focused on treatment of infected individuals and on eradication of any or all member species of SCP-129. Although at least 98% of the world's population harbors a natural immunity to one or more species of SCP-129, Outbreaks that reach stage 3 or higher must be contained as quickly as possible, with infected individuals quarantined under highest risk contagion protocols. In the event of stage 4 or stage 5 outbreak, in addition to the above procedures, data expunged. Description: SCP-129 is a series of different species of fungus that can infect any animal with mucosal membranes. Infection by SCP-129 can pass through up to five stages. Depending on exposure to further member species of SCP-129, individual resistance, and other factors, with each stage of infection facilitating progression to the next stage by weakening the individual's resistance to subsequent infection. Due to a combination of historical events, most humans and animals are naturally immune to SCP-129-4 through SCP-129. Therefore, Outbreaks of stage 3 infections are quite rare, but have the potential for widespread infection if not swiftly isolated and contained. All known cases of SCP-129 have followed a five-stage progression, although data expunged, possibly due to mutation. Stage 1 The first organism, SCP-129-1, attacks the victim's mucosal membranes, multiplying quickly and unobtrusively. 
A faint yeast-like smell might be detected, but beyond that, SCP-1291 is asymptomatic. A second organism, SCP-1292, can then infect the host, causing the victim to experience symptoms identical to those of acute viral nasopharyngitis, the common cold. The decreased efficacy of the host's immune system due to infection from SCP-1292 allows SCP-1291 to become entrenched further. SCP-1291 and 2 generally leave the host body within four to six days. Though both species are fairly widespread, and most of the population has little to no protection against either organism, they pose little danger themselves, except to facilitate infection by SCP-1293. Stage 2 Although SCP-1293 is usually stopped by natural mucus, Stage 1 infection changes the composition of the host's mucus so that the host is significantly less resistant to SCP-1293. Once established in the host, SCP-1293 alters the host's mucus, lymph, and blood such that other species of SCP-129 can thrive in the host. Symptoms of Stage 2 infection include greatly increased mucus production, a nagging cough due to excess phlegm, a lingering low-grade fever, increased sweating and salivating, a somewhat increased preference for vegetables, and the complaint that certain fruit juices taste odd. Infection by SCP-1293 generally lasts anywhere from two weeks to four months before being driven out by the immune system, unless the host enters stage 3 infection. At least 90% of all humans have experienced stage 2 infection at some point, but due to natural immunities, in spite of stage 2 infection, and the relative rarity of stage 3 species, few have passed into stage 3. Stage 3 In the absence of SCP-1293, nearly all animals are immune to the three species that cause stage 3 infection. However, a small number of stage 2 victims can become infected with one or more of these species. In these cases, the fungal infections become entrenched in the host and cannot be removed without extraordinary measures. Individually, the three stage 3 species elicit different symptoms in the host. SCP-1294 causes increased tear production, lacrimation, slight yellowing of the eyes. SCP-1295 causes the host's nails to thicken and significantly increases earwax production. SCP-1296 data expunged, in particular, bright yellow urine and small pellets in the host's feces, both of which smell strongly of yeast. However, a victim who becomes infected with all three of these species will, within hours, develop flu-like, or worse, symptoms and become bedridden for three to five weeks. Afterward, Though the victim appears to have recovered fully, in actuality, SCP-129 has spread throughout all systems in the host's body, marking passage into Stage 4. Stage 4 Victims who reach Stage 4 appear generally healthy, and indeed may be more lively and energetic than at any time since first contracting SCP-129. In actuality, SCP-129-1-6 through have spread throughout the host's body, completely infiltrating the subject's immune respiratory, circulatory, reproductive, and central nervous systems. Mycelia from SCP-129 species also permeate the host's skin and replace some percentage of the host's hair. These hyphae, which are nearly indistinguishable from the host's natural hair, are used to propagate SCP-129 to other hosts. Any potential host that comes into contact with shed-off hyphae has an extremely high chance of becoming infected with SCP-129. Hyphae seem to be equally contagious from any part of the host's body. Despite, or perhaps because of, increased susceptibility to SCP-129, Stage 4 victims are much more resistant to viral and bacterial pathogens than uninfected subjects. All known subjects who have reached Stage 4 have either progressed to Stage 5 or died within weeks. Stage 5 Symptoms of Stage 5 infection depend on a variety of factors including the particular Stage 5 species that are present, as well as genetic, physiological, environmental, and any number of unknown factors. However, as in Stage 4, all Stage 5 victims are highly contagious and can infect victims who had previously shown complete immunity. Notable Manifestations of Stage 5 Symptoms February 
Witnesses riding in a commuter train car described a woman suddenly blowing up like a balloon and exploding. But instead of blood and viscera, the contents of the car were covered in spores and filaments. Analysis later showed that the victim was infected with SCP-1299, SCP-12914, and SCP-129. All persons and objects in the affected area were quarantined, euthanized, and incinerated per protocol. Several casualties, including Foundation personnel. May Following a string of disappearances in data expunged were tracked to a cave several kilometers from town. Inside, investigators found several pulsating mounds of flesh and vegetative material. Although most were unrecognizable, a few of the entities retained some human characteristics and were identified as some of the missing citizens. Researchers theorized that victims of this combination of SCP-129 would interact normally with the populace, attempting to infect others, until, after a period of time, they would come to the cave. How and why they were brought here is not known. Upon arrival, the victims would be changed into the pulsating vegetative flesh mounds, which appear to be organisms modified to provide a long-term source of sustenance for SCP-129. Analysis suggests the flesh mounds could potentially live for several years. Autopsy revealed the presence of SCP-12910, SCP-12911, SCP-12914, and SCP-129. Site quarantined and sanitized per protocol. Item number SCP-149 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-149, in any of its instances, is to be kept inside a sealed plexiglass box for observation. Oxygen and a nutrient mist are to be released into the containment cell every two hours. If any instance of SCP-149 escapes its cell, Protocol 42 Charlie is to be brought into effect on any and all contaminated personnel by order of 0512 after Incident 149-1. Description SCP-149 is a breed of mosquito, which carries a strain of retrovirus, herein referred to as SCP-149-A, that mutates regenerating human cells into fertilized mosquito eggs. SCP-149-A is injected directly into the bloodstream when SCP-149 feeds. The SCP-149-A quickly works on the nucleus of the cells, warping the DNA. The first set of cells bred from these changed instructions closely resemble cysts and are concentrated in the lining of the esophagus and the sinuses. Upon dissection, however, these cysts are revealed to be filled with SCP-149's larva, the cysts acting as a protective casing against external forces. SCP-149 appears to go through its maturation cycle in a matter of hours. By the time the subject is able to feel any effects, the first generation of SCP-149 has already grown inside the subject's body. SCP-149 primarily achieves exodus through the mouth and nostrils, occasionally being diverted through the sphenoid sinuses to escape through the eye sockets. Infection by SCP-149 is fatal, and chance of infection has been estimated to be 50% from one bite. Addendum Incident 149-1 An incidence of SCP-149 escaped and infected multiple Class D subjects, the majority of whom did not report SCP-149's contact with them. Within five hours, SCP-149 had matured in these hosts and burst out of them, infecting several staff members. It was only thanks to the quick thinking of Dr. who sealed sublevels 12 through 15 that the entire site was not infected. As a response to this, O5 Command has created Protocol 42 Charlie to be used if SCP-149 escapes confinement. Item Number SCP-156 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-156 is to be kept in Refrigerated Storage Unit 19C, except when removed for experimentation. Subjects infected by SCP-156 are to be restrained and monitored for their own safety. From September 21st to March 21st, infected subjects should be kept within a secure storage unit unless the experiment's parameters indicate otherwise. 
Both storage facilities should be monitored by security camera. The termination and autopsy of D-Class personnel assigned to SCP-156 should be delayed until after March 21st. No personnel are permitted to consume SCP-156, except D-Class personnel, unless approved by a Level 3 staff member. Description SCP-156 is a group of exactly 181 pomegranate arrows. The number of instances of SCP-156 is constant. When one is ingested or destroyed, it is replaced instantaneously with a new one, among the largest group of contiguous instances. Otherwise, the instances can be moved around freely. After leaving the group, i.e. after an instance is touching no other instance, the instance will spoil normally, after which a new instance will appear. When all instances are destroyed simultaneously, all 181 instances reappear randomly at the location of one of the destroyed arrows. Attempts to measure the time between destruction of one instance and the appearance of a new one using high-speed cameras have so far failed. If SCP-156 is ingested between March 21st and September 20th, subjects display no signs of infection until noon of September 21st, when all vital processes abruptly cease. A similar effect is observed immediately when SCP-156 is ingested after September 21st. Despite being technically dead, post-mortem examinations of subjects have been unable to discover a cause of death. Subjects appear to have been in perfect health, aside from any pre-existing conditions. While dead, subjects do not show any signs of decomposition, though the bodies of many subjects begin displaying bruising and scarring consistent with torture. While the majority of subjects suffer these wounds, not all do, and no reliable formula has been discovered to predict which subjects will be affected. Infected subjects remain in this dormant state until noon of March 21st, when life processes restart. Subjects remember little of the intervening time period. While most subjects are entirely unaware that any time has passed since their apparent death, some claim to recall a pale white male face and a wilting pomegranate tree. Subjects continue to die and reanimate annually on September and March 21st, respectively, until killed by another cause. Reanimation only occurs from deaths caused by ingesting SCP-156. After undergoing a single death reanimation cycle, subjects begin displaying high levels of distress and paranoia as time approaches September 21st, even if they have not been made aware of the death reanimation cycle. Furthermore, Subjects will take extreme lengths to avoid taking any sort of risk or danger to their person, even if they had displayed risk-taking behaviors prior to ingesting SCP-156. Over the course of multiple death reanimation cycles, these psychological symptoms become more pronounced. At the same time, physical symptoms during the dormant period increase in intensity for the subjects suffering from them. Eventually, Physical wounds on subjects will begin to emulate burns and puncture wounds. Many subjects gain a phobia of dogs and dead plants after three to five reanimations. After several deaths caused by SCP-156, the ocular tissue undergrows necrosis in many subjects. This tissue does not reanimate with the rest of the body. Often, after ten or more reanimations, reanimation of bodily processes will occur but the subject will fail to regain consciousness, entering a comatose state. Death and reanimation continues annually, even after subjects have reached this stage. SCP-156 came to the attention of the Foundation after an incident in Greece. After several people died on September 21st, 19... without apparent cause. The Foundation became involved after locals reported the return of several of the dead who had been interred in above-ground vaults the following spring. After questioning these subjects, all reported having attended a party at the house of one A.K., who had been buried and was found asphyxiated in her coffin. SCP-156 was discovered within the house, fresh, despite the intervening six months since the incident. Testing commenced on D-Class personnel. D-E15624, the first test subject, died in September and was autopsied. No cause of death could be found. Subject was left under monitoring and storage. In March of the same year, subject began to show brain activity, and subject's heart began beating 
despite the body having taken significant damage during the autopsy. D-E15624 expired shortly thereafter, without regaining consciousness. Errol's given SCP status, and longer-term testing was ordered. Item Number SCP-164 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Cultures of SCP-164 should be contained using standard Class III biohazardous procedures and stored clearly marked within a refrigerated biocontainment unit at 10 degrees Celsius. While pathogenic, SCP-164 is not highly infectious. While researchers working with raw cultures or infected subjects should use caution, latex gloves and face masks are generally effective at preventing the spread of the disease. Any personnel inadvertently infected will be subject to six months of chemotherapy upon first showing symptoms, and surgery as necessary. Civilian outbreaks should be handled using cover-up procedure ALEF for contagious materials. Description SCP-164 is a strain of cancerous cells that cause sarcoma-like tumors in host bodies. While cell DNA appears to be primarily derived from human DNA, the cells now effectively exist as unicellular, asexually reproducing parasites. Several characteristics make SCP-164 remarkable. SCP-164 is the only parasitic, transmittable cancer known to infect human beings. Strains are transmittable through, in order of infectiousness, blood contact, sexual intercourse, skin contact, and airborne contact. Chemotherapy and surgery are effective in treating the disease in nearly all stages. Tumors produced by SCP-164 that grow larger than a certain size will, in 75% of cases, follow normal behavior for cancerous sarcomas. However, in 25% of cases, host bodily materials will be utilized for the creation of a new, separate organism inside the tumor. In the case of multiple tumors, some or all may follow this behavior. Said organisms will apparently begin as zygotes, fertilized ova, and replicate, much like fetuses. Externally, this appears no different from normal tumor production, and may go unnoticed in initial stages. Oddly, mature organisms identify as being completely unrelated to the original tumors, corresponding with a previously unknown species of order Toothida, squids. Removal of organisms show that they are entirely viable in marine conditions, and will perform normal actions such as locomotion, catching food, basic defense, reproduction, etc. However, said organisms will also remain entirely viable in the original tumor, rarely moving or shifting position, continuing to grow at a regular rate until the host is killed. The existence and nature of the organisms, SCP-164-2, is often not realized in civilian cases until biopsy or surgery reveals the developed organism. SCP-164 organisms and tumors may interact with host physiology in interesting ways. The following cases are particularly notable. Female D-Class, 23 years old. SCP-164 tumors spawned on uterus walls. Host body apparently recognized the tumor as a human fetus and was delivered normally containing viable SCP-164-2 specimen after nine months. Male D-Class, 30 years old. Tumors spawned on the spinal cord, disrupting the central nervous system. As a result, movement from SCP-164-2 would occasionally cause subjects' limbs to flail, suggesting a cross-wiring of the nervous systems of the two organisms. Biopsy lent support to this hypothesis. Male D-Class, 25 years old. Tumors spawn near the esophagus and windpipe of the subject, in a location that with ordinary growth would normally have blocked off said passages and quickly killed the subject. Instead, the growth of the tumors shifted to the back of the neck, preventing subject from dying before the normal point. Dr. suggests that this may have been a deliberate action taken by SCP-164. Lesson complete. 
To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.